Hello, beautiful you. Thank you for being here with me on Alexandra Joy TV. Today, I am thrilled and honored to be with Martin Cohen. I'm gonna do a little bit of an introduction first, Martin, if that's okay. I'm so Martin has been a professional coach and relationship expert way before there was even the category called life coaching, which I am one. He has led programs on men and women in relationships for over 30 years, if not 40. Close to 40. Close to 40. He's a master and called a guru of gender balancing, uh, which we will get more into what that means in this conversation we are having today. He's also participated in thousands of hours of transformational work. And what I would say about you is you've always been on the leading edge of the human potential movement. Always. Thank you. Martin has been uh, partnering with individuals, empowering them to achieve unprecedented levels of success, happiness, and satisfaction in their lives for much longer than, as I said, the self-help revolution was even uh, coined the self-help revolution. And he has written a new book, which is really exciting. Congratulations. It's Thank called you. Gender Balancing. Um, it is truly an evolutionary model for elevating relationships from mediocre to, to extraordinary. extraordinary. Yep, that's it. So it's an absolute honor and joy to be with you. So let's start with a little bit about you. We've known each other for, oh, it's been a long time. You tell me. 30 years, something like that. We met in New York City. Really, what I always call as the, the beginning of the self-help, maybe not the total beginning of the self-help, Right. You know, era. But back in the mid 80s, I remember doing one of your workshops, uh, Men and Women. What was All it about called? men and women. All about men and women. And there were not, no one was, you know, speaking that language back then. So um, I just would love to know what got you into really distinguishing all of it, you know, what it is to be a man, a woman, what had you in your personal life get so inspired to inspire others to be great in their relationships? Well, briefly, I heard it as a youngster. I would listen to the words and listen to the tenor of the person speaking, and it was just so noticeably different to hear girls and women different in their speaking and where they're coming from in sounds than men. And I was intrigued by it. And the more I listened to them and the more I asked them questions like, how are you? And heard the boys and the men say, fine, good, okay. Or say nothing or shrug their shoulders and ask the girls and women, how are you? And they would hesitate and you'd see a torrent of words come out speaking about everything from their classmates to their body to their parents and complaints and they would speak in a way that was just amazing mm -hmm. and I heard them speak from inside me and when I would hear boys and men speak I would hear it externally so I grew up changing channels, listening to girls and women on one channel and when I was listening to the men changing channels and then beginning to notice and document the differences. And the differences were extraordinary. So noticeably different. So you didn't start out as a coach. You had a different life, right, in New York before you really became yeah. a coach when there wasn't even that category. True. Given that my grandmother, Hana, and my mother, Lily, had such a big impact on my life, I began to relate to women in a particular way. My grandmother had this male energy, strong, powerful. My mother just loving and generous, and I would just be influenced by them. And I'm sure I took it in, and it had a very big impression and on my whole and, life. And, and with that influence, how did your father influence who my, you were? Mm, my father was very physical, very charismatic, was out in the world doing what he was doing. In the world of uh, being an operator, sewing, and being in the world of athletics, playing handball and punch ball and stick ball and billiards and pool. So he was very much back then what we would call a man's man. Yeah, like a guy. And did you have any heartache yourself in, in kind of not owning both traits in yourself in marriages or relationships? 
Well, later on, I started to see it very clearly. Uh, I certainly took on my father and the male influence. Mm. But as I began to listen and get closer and more involved within myself, the speaking of what was being said and not being said by girls and women were just inspiring to me. They spoke to much more of a picture of the future in a way that was different than the men. The men spoke about the picture, but it was very specific, very solid, whereas the women actually spoke in a way that I saw a whole picture. Like a vision. Yeah, it was like in cinematography mm. for women, whereas with men it was very specific and very positional. This table, yeah. you know, this way of doing it, as against a woman who would say one word and it would all, it would just light up something. So especially when you were talking in the area of feelings and commitment and love and compassion, it just was a whole other way of communicating. And obviously you've been married now. 30, 31 years. 31 years. So yes. you practice this. <laughs> you've had your own Petri dish, correct? <laughs> yeah, well, for, for the most part, yeah. I mean, I'm challenged myself because people are different. Yeah. You know, I mean, we're the same as human beings at one level, but as species, we are very much different. You know, that's amazing, the differences there are, and that's where the real challenge is. Can I embrace the differences? Right. Can I embrace your differences than mine? And the more I began to see closely and distinguish the differences, the more I began to understand the difference between a man and a woman and a woman and a man. What is gender balancing? What are specific male and female traits. And so when we were born that way, we took on what was seemingly the identity of a woman and the identity of a man. Mm -hmm. Well, this is the way a woman does things. It's what she acts. This is the manner in which she sees her life evolving and the man being the same. And yet, if we were to break down the dynamics of who a man is and who a woman is in terms of their respective energies, if in fact there is a woman and a man in each of us, you'd actually begin to see. And of course this comes from years of observation and documentation that you would say to, uh, you know, you could, a man would speak about something and you could actually see something specific and solid. And a woman would speak something and it was ethereal ethereal in a way, and yet it communicated. And it seems that there is a conversation around what it is to be a woman, and especially to be a woman in the entrepreneurial world or the corporate world. And you know, up until now, probably in the last 20 years, women have been told to own more of their male, you know, to be more powerful, you know, all kind of what you just kind of defined potentially as male traits. Yet, there's also this conversation in tandem to that, that women should be women. You know, we should be owning our divine feminine power, you know, whatever that means, mm -hmm. coming from a female place. So can you speak to that? Because sure. I, I think it gets confused yeah. out there. Actually, to survive in the culture, in the condition of life that we were born into, women consciously or unconsciously were competing in a way in a man's world. And competing in a man's world, things began to become clear that there was tangible results that they were committed to. And that brought about a particular way of being you mean that like was... You started a company as a manager and then you see the next role and you go for that, that kind of yeah, addressing I that? I think or? that we should just go back a little bit. So mm -hmm. if we just take it preliminarily, mm -hmm. we could say now, this is all subjective, mm -hmm. we could say that water is a female energy. We could say that fire is a male energy. Mm -hmm. We could say, uh, we could say that, um, that solid, that something linear is male and something that is ethereal is right. female. We could say that, um, that 
Speaking is male. And we could say that listening is female. We could say that um, force right. might be male. We could say the flow or the dance might be female. But again, you'd have to give up while I'm talking that yeah. this is, well, it sounds like female is better than male or male is better than female. And once you do that, you're now going to create the opposing positions. And now you're creating that conflict between your male and female energies within you. And the primary energy that would be controlling or running you or manipulating you is the energy that you most need to survive. So it, of late, over the last, let's say, the last 30, 40 years especially, women have accentuated, have have trained their male energy to compete, to succeed, to not be dominated. They've generated that. And men actually have backed off the male energy, and we've actually developed a stronger female energy. But again, you have to give up your attachment to you being a woman or me being a man. And by giving up the attachment and observing the respective energies of which is running the show, which energy is, you could just notice it without any kind of self-invalidation or making yourself, mm, that's interesting, I could feel my male energy. And you notice it, and at the point that you notice it, with no judgment, mm -hmm. you'll find the female energy surface, and all of a sudden you'll find that which was appearing strong or hard or aggressive comes up soft. In, in any individual, usually, usually you have a more predominant, predominant feminine or masculine energy. But even when it's 50-50, you're missing 50% female and 50% male. Oh, say more about that. Sure. There are people who appear to be relatively balanced. They're patient, they're, they're, uh, they're open, they're receptive, they can actually just be. And that person does have a predominant female energy, but it's not like that there's not a male energy there. There is a male energy there, but that predominant female energy is the energy that's actually th how that person is constituted. That person clearly is moving more towards, towards what we're calling a female energy. Mm -hmm. I personally have this desire to um, I don't know I don't I don't you know to let to be more in touch with my divi my divinely inspired feminine power in chargeness you know that it that it's that it's not so uh, like a mallet sometimes which is my experience of myself well, or that, I've been told <laughs> so that's another kind of power mm -hmm. that power the leadership the generation comes from the listening of the person or who the person is being. So that's another, that is a very powerful female energy. I mean, that's really extraordinary. Now we could say in the physical realm, you know, fire, fire is the very strong, fire, yeah. yet the water it's of there. a female could put out the fire. So it's very interesting. I mean, in, in martial arts, it's very interesting. There's a soft style of martial arts that oftentimes is in a dance with the hard style of the male energy. And you see the dance of the softness, of the harmony, of the way of being that is, operates in one way. And you begin to see the dance of life from another perspective. But to bring it to a point, where you're not thinking about female and male energy. Right. So you could literally own exactly your birthright, having it all. You, you now have the possibility and the potential that exactly the appropriate energy at that time is what is causing, what is creating life. And so there's no conflict. Because one of the things I was going to ask you, um, uh, you know, which is more specific to exactly what's going on in the world, is divorce rates are through the roof. You know, there's a lot of what you could say relationship breakdowns and how this conversation actually relates 
to that. You know, I, I'm not saying you're trying to save the world, but are you trying to save the world with, with this being a, a function, a primary function of what could really make a difference? Well, if you want to know what I stand for in regard to what you're saying, it's uh, a declared uh, world peace among all women and men because I assert that there is a war or a conflict that exists almost always in the best of relationships that exist between a woman and a man and a man and a woman. And that war, I assert, is actually is inside the imbalance and is inside a cultural uh, condition referred to as uh, the condition of patriarchy. And the oh, okay. condition of patriarchy, the man needed to uh, provide, to protect, to, uh, to support the woman in a way that she required and needed him. And then it evolved into that the two of us could live more economically better by living together than not. So there was a need that we had for each other. Is this what you're calling marriage? No, I'm, I'm, well, no, I'm not calling this marriage at oh, all. Okay. I'm just okay. saying marriage is not natural. Hmm. Marriage is something that was created by, by human beings. Yes. And the differences are very powerful between women and men. And marriage is not for everyone. Marriage has got to be for people who are particularly evolved, who are willing to actually embrace each other's differences. What do I want from you? Should we talk about what we want from each other? Mm. Would, that, would that move this forward? You mean right now? Whenever you want. No, no, go. Well, if we were to speak about what a man wants from a woman and a woman wants from a man, what I... What you would want from me as a man is for me to be fun. Fun in a way that you're not fun. Women are actually complicated in a way that they're not the fun fun that a man is. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm fun in my marriage. <laughs> well, but you're fun in your I mean, marriage, fun, but... but except your past, present, and future are going on all at one time. Yes. Yes. And you're thinking about many things at one time, All past, one present, time. and future. And it's very different from a man. A man pretty much is confronting and facing what's right in front of him. Yes. And it's very singular. But that's a fun, like in fundamentally fun. So you want me to be fun with you because you are in so many places that when I'm actually being fun, fundamental, it's like, wow, could... It be that simple? Could present. life be that easy? Because you're present. Yes. Yeah. Present and male, fun. Yeah. So you want me to be fun. You want me to be certain and clear. And why you want me to be certain and clear is, Alexandra, would you please wear a blue dress with beautiful earrings and a brooch and have your hair look exactly the way, you, the way it is right now? <coughs> and I'm picking you up at 8 o'clock tonight. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, and the rest of the night and morning are up to me. Uh, so when I'm being certain and clear and you don't have to think without me dominating you, without me trying right, to tell you what to do. some women would think that you were, they would hear this conversation and think, well, he's trying to control her. No, I know that's not what you're doing. Because no, I, I remember going on dates and if the male would say, uh, I don't know, you choose or something. I mean, it was like I couldn't even make it through the first yes. date. I, I, want, I wanted him You to want be that clear. man to be yeah. certain and clear so it, you literally can give up your thinking. Like a laser went ah, there yeah. without all the stuff going on. Right. So you want it to be certain and clear, and you want him to be a lover generator, pursuing you, generating, creating. And you will dance when I'm leading that. When I'm leading... The, the pursuit, you will enjoy, you will get into it. So when I'm being, because the truth is men are so fundamentally generous. We love to give. Women love to receive for the purpose of giving back more than they're receiving. Mm. Fascinating that I want nothing more than to give to you and to come after you 
and pursue you. But what's so interesting is that, you know, in the era that I was in New York in my 20s dating in is when uh, Women Who Love Too Much, that book came out. Yes. And, you know, for my generation of women, it was a huge training ground for why our, you know, first to third dates weren't working is because I'm now realizing we were doing what the male in this conversation that you're saying not should be doing, but had the, like in that dynamic, he should have been doing versus the woman in that book, you know, don't chase the guy, don't, you know, that was all coaching around, you know, strategies, let him call you back, you know, it was all that yes. kind of strategy stuff, but it's from this place that you're saying. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, the, the women, the women should really allow the man to find you without you looking for the one. Yeah. Let the man find you. I and, love it when you say that in the book. Well, and why that's important is that you get yourself as an amazing resource, as a treasure. And uh, to, to add on to that conversation, I believe that when we are connected to our essence and living inside of our whys and our purposes from that essence, it's not that we don't quote unquote need a man. I'm not saying that. It's just that it's just we're whole and complete. You know, we're right. in our, uh, wh why we're here on the planet. And then yes. we partner from wholeness and complete being complete, which took me a long time to get to that point because that's right. not the way I started out in my 20s, you know, in, date, in my dating world. Yes. So if in fact I was fun and certain and clear and I was a love a generator and I was contextually always profoundly respecting you, I assert you have it all. That I am fun. Yes. I'm oh, you mean all from you. That yeah, you have all that you want to need from the man. He's loving you. He's fun. He's certain and clear, and he's profoundly respectful. So now, what as the woman would the man want? What I would want from you, I would want you to be safe. For me to be this foolish kid who is only seeing what he is seeing that you're safe for me to be this little kid and this brilliant, wonderful, wise man, and that you were not criticizing me, you were not making me wrong, you were not thinking, oh, my God, you're being so immature. So I want you most of all to be, to be so safe for me to be who I am and who I'm not, and that would be a gift. I would want you to be visionary because you can see the big picture into the future in a way that I don't see it. And when you could see that big picture and you could point to that big picture into the future for me, and at first I may not get it, but when I do get it, you can see something about the future that works for me, you, and both of us in a way that's a turn on for me. Yeah. And I don't see it that way. And lastly, I want you to be so, as you said before, whole and complete as a woman that you don't need me, but you would choose me. Hmm. And you'd be that, safe for me to be who I am and who I'm not, the visionary for you to actually be not whole not and need. complete and not needing me and that you're authentically acknowledging me for what I am creating, for what I am doing, for the generosity I am in wanting to keep giving and loving and building something with you, I have it all. You're safe, you're visionary, you're whole and complete, and you acknowledge me for being the great man I am. So now, did you just describe what would take a relationship or a marriage from me mediocre to extraordinary? Abso or absolutely. Or that when we come together creates that extraordinary place to, Absolutely. to rest in? Yes. And of course you want to really understand the changes that one goes through in relationship. You want to understand how important it is that you and I have a complete relationship with our parents. Because those, those were the first woman and man that you ever fell in well, love say with. Say a little about that, because that was a little confusing. I mean, ah. We know kind of what that means, but what does that really yeah. mean for people? At the, at the time, from the time that you were born, the assimilation, the, what you were absorbing and receiving, 
and understanding from the mother and father, and sometimes if it's a single parent, the single parent is being both the mother and father, is one in which the love and the trust was all being built on. It was all being built on. So the, the trust of you the as the trust of the child, child and yeah, to I the mean, adult. It's even extreme. Even if the child, uh, sadly or unfortunately, was hurt by the parents, that child actually loves the parent no yes. matter what. Yes. You know, a lawyer wouldn't put a child on, even if the child was abused, against the mother or father because the child... Would choose the, abused, the abuser, yes. Because the child loves the mother and father, yeah. does not have the grasp to yeah. understand that him being hurt is something that means that there's something bad or wrong there. Yeah. If anything, he might or she might make himself bad or wrong, yes. not the parent. So if you have this wonderful relationship, it doesn't mean you have to like your mother and father, yeah. but if you have this wonderful relationship with your mom and dad, and that's the foundation of your female male inside you, of right. loving your mother and father. And that relationship could be done, uh, that wonderful relationship you're talking about could be done in this uh, experience of the relationship because sometimes where people, including myself, get messed up, it's the the parent isn't necessarily behaving in a way that you would give them that what what you said wonderful this is a wonderful relationship yeah. but if you and yourself are complete and have that gratitude for right. your life and the gift your life is then you're dealing with the stuff that comes up in a way that you know, leaves you empowered because your context, right? Like the, the context is the basket that holds the apples. The apples is yes. the story. Yes. Did you use that analogy? I think you yes. did. Yes. Uh, you know that that then you can deal with the apples if you have the context. Look. Yeah. Or or another way of saying it, what you and I would consider bad behavior, or inappropriate behavior, or where parents are that off you could actually begin experience them that all as an expression of their love for you. Mm. So it doesn't any longer show up as bad. So my father was very hard on me. And my father uh, sometimes was particularly physical with me. And it took me well into my 30s to so understand, yeah, yeah, to understand that that was my father's expression of his love for me. Mm, how, how did you... Do that, turn that around. Well, I, I turned it around because I understood at some point through a lot of work on myself. In yes, as we A all lot of work on myself, yes. in, in, certainly in the area of transformation, is that uh, my father had no idea how to, like so many of us, how to w express love. And so his expression of love was paying attention to, doing it his way. His expression of love sometimes was no communication whatsoever. Mm. Yet underneath it, which we can't see or understand, was that he loves me unconditionally. Doesn't fit, doesn't make sense. So at some point, my father never said he loved me. And at the age of 38, I said to my father, just out of the blue when I actually got it, Dad, although you never said you loved me, I just want you to know something, Pop. I know how much you love me. And there was silence on the other side. And he said, Marty, I love you. And from that time on, our relationship was never the same. Mm. So it's, it's really, it's, it's sad to say that hitting or abuse is an expression of love because it's certainly, in, oh. certainly inequitable and, and tragic. Yeah. Yet in many ways, it's it is an expression of love. Right. It is. But when you can actually be born into it or get conscious to it, the way we are at this I mean, time. Not that we're condoning abuse. None absolutely of that. not. And if someone is in an abusive situation. The first thing you would tell that person, out. get out of there. Get out. But, you're but even when they get out of there, I don't want them to hold on to that for the rest of their life. Because? Because it lives inside them. Because they're now being angry or hating right. someone underneath who they want nothing more than to love them. Yes. So it makes no sense. Which then shows up in future relationships. Absolutely.
Yeah. And that's when the imbalance gets even more imbalanced between male and female because you make decisions to protect yourself and some people... And the trust isn't will, there. Yeah. And people but and, the yeah. male energy will predominant will become predominant to protect and the female sometimes will be predominant to protect them by backing off and being passive but all to protect themselves that's right I can recognize that in myself for sure you know the proclivity towards one or the other you'll either absolutely attack or take yourself away so one of the things that you say about the future model of love in the book is you say the love I speak to in my love for you so this is in a relationship. The love I speak to and my love for you virtually makes me and my identity disappear. All there is then is my standing and creating being completely in your world. Therefore, I have chosen to surrender and to powerfully experience you from a perspective that empowers me to love and be loved by you, which, of course, couldn't happen if you weren't complete with your parents. So that was one component of... That is a prerequisite, that, that you're prerequisite complete with your parents. We can finish those you know, requirements. Yes. But what did you mean by that? Because I think some people, that would be a lot to digest. Mm -hmm. I love it and get it, but I mean, it would be a lot if yeah. I didn't know you. <laughs> the, the thing is, is if I would just sweetly surrender to your way of being, your speaking, your non-speaking, your actions, your inactions, but really completely surrender and begin to experience what it is like for me to be you. How, what is it like to be you at, at such a... Like standing in my shoes. More than standing in your shoes, but it's like I want to think what you're thinking now. Yes. And I don't want to, it's not even being psychic about it. It's like such a profound empathy to, to just be there where at the time I'm being there, I'm transcending my own identity and my own ego. So in giving that up, it's now like I'm nothing, and all there is there is something, and now this nothing is creating this something that's coming back to me in a way that I'm feeling love from you and for myself in a way that I never dreamed. Mm. Yeah, now I get what you meant by, the <laughs> by that phrase. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. And that's, so that is what an extraordinary relationship would be. Well, there is, in the extraordinary relationship, it is, uh, how I refer to it is you or me, two separate individuals in a relationship, right. you and me, where they are Which many people closer are so the you to, and to you or me, mm -hmm. where there's a dance, and there might be a little space in there, but there's a dance in there that I am so in your world and you're so in my world, and there's such a dance, simpatico, inside that respective world that I'm complete as a human being. 